if you show this again here, I'm going to bust your ass. And uh, standing next to me was Al Bendick, who was a, the ACLU lawyer then. And he says, boy, do we have a good case. <laughs> we didn't. Oh, you didn't? No. So we sued the city of Berkeley, the county of Alameda, mm -hmm. uh, since they had threatened to arrest me if we showed this again. Declaratory relief, I think it's called. And we lost. The judge looked at the film and he says, what's a nice young man like you showing a dirty film like this? And it was a film made by Jean Genet called uh, Un Chant d'Amour, A Song of Love. And it was about the, the uh, interior sex fantasies of prisons, prisoners and guards in a prison. The prisoners were all romantic and the guards were all sadistic. And that was basically the film. And it attracted very wide audiences. This is how the Mime Troupe discovered the huge gay community in San Francisco, because they all came to the movie. And uh, the cops busted it when we showed it in San Francisco. They took, well, they had busted a, um, yeah, they busted the film and took the projector. And I said, why are you taking the projector? You're going to run a ballistics test on it? And he says, well, you showed the film on this projector. I said, you could show this film on any projector. <laughs> so, why you? Anyway, it was truly stupid. They, a few days later, they handed the film back, you know, with all the sprocket holes torn, because they obviously watched it over and over again at police headquarters. <laughs> and the, the district attorney um, said, you know, who is this guy, Janet? And so he said, he's a famous French playwright. And the DA says, give them the damn film back. We've lost three of these already. They'd lost the case against Ferlinghetti, f publishing dirty books, you know, Howell and Henry Miller. <coughs> they lost the case in, against Lenny Bruce. And I forget the third one. Um, I think it was uh, the D.H. Lawrence book, uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover. And he says, I don't want to do lose another case. <laughs> So when he found out this was a famous French playwright, he said, the hell with it. You know, I'm not going to go prosecute this. And that's how we got to, sh so we went over to Berkeley and showed it. And of course, the, the cop had never heard of Genet either. What did he know? Is this when you decided to become a filmmaker? I'm just no, curious, right? no, no, no. That was something no. else. Okay, well, what, after all this activity in, in the Berkeley area, uh, Bay Area, what prompted you to move to D.C. in 1972? Well, I was... Uh, Give it, I got money to start a film project at the Institute for Policy Studies. And so Mark and Dick uh, invited me to come. And so we showed up in 72 and we began a film project. And we ended up making several films. One was the first little practice film we did, which was a film on C.L.R. James, who at that time was teaching at... Uh, Howard? N not Howard, D.C. DC College. Oh, Federal City College. Federal City College. Uh, and then we went and we made a film on Congress called Who Shot Alexander Hamilton? Um, a little shown, but I think good film. And then we made a film called A Song for Dead Warriors out at uh, this uh, Oglala Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. So it was an interesting project. And, and, you know, once you get to IPS, you never want to leave. That's true. Well, when you got here in 1972, uh what did you, what did you uh, think about the social justice activist scene here? Did you, what was it like? What did it feel like? Well, it was a lot less than what was going on in the Bay Area. In the Bay Area, I mean, was at the height of activism. Mm -hmm. Anti-war, civil rights, incipient gay movement, women's movement, uh, consciousness raising on all levels going on, uh, and, and me involved in the theater. And then I worked, went to work... Um, Afterwards, I wrote my first book with Paul Jacobs in 1965, came out in 66, called The New Radicals, where we did a history of the, the movement of the SDS and the SNCC and the Du Bois Clubs and all of, all of the groups that had started out, which became the movement at the time. Um, and after that, I was hired by KQED, which was the local public television station, to write a film script for a network documentary uh, which was called Losing Just the Same. It was about a black ghetto family in West Oakland, a mother with 10 children, each with a different father. 
and the film focused on the oldest boy, 17-year-old kid, dropped out of high school, and had absolutely no possibility of making it in life. I mean, he hadn't learned anything in school, so he had no skills, he couldn't work. Um, and as his mother said, and this is where the title came from, doesn't matter what Robert does, he ends up losing just the same. And um, so that was the first film I did for public television. And that was in the Bay Area? Yes, in right. Oakland. And then the subsequent films you made here? Right? No, I, I, I stayed at KQED. We made, the next film we made was called uh, Report from Cuba. We did a film in 1967 in Cuba. And then in 67, 68, we did a, one called From Protest to Resistance on the movement itself with Mario Savio, Stokely Carmichael, and David Harris. So I was both participating in and filming the activities of the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement. And uh, then in 68, we made Fidel. We went back to Cuba and filmed, I think we were there a couple of months filming with Fidel Castro. That was in 68? 68. So. The film went on public television in 69. Mm -hmm. And then its theatrical opening was supposed to be in New York, except that the right-wing Cuban exiles bombed the theater. So we were going to open it in Los Angeles, and they burned down the theater there. They had, uh, how should I say, strong views on free speech. Mm -hmm. Well, you got here in 1972, and... Um you went to IPS and did films, and yes. then what else did you do uh, in those years? Well, you know, we, we, went, we went out to demonstrations. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we would demonstrate in front of Congress and then go in and film in Congress. And we didn't see any problem with it. And in those days, you could go into Congress. It wasn't so hard to get in. You could walk in? You right. just walked in. Well, let's, get, let's talk about that a little bit. You, you, and the, uh, you personally and the Institute for Policy Studies were... Um, especially successful in cultivating good relationships with the uh, important members of Congress. And this is at a time when lots of leftists didn't think that Congress was worth working for, working with. It, you know, they didn't want to do it. And, and, but you did very well by it and had some real movement. And can you talk a little about how did you do that? How did you get so... Well, the first thing is be realistic. I mean, who makes the laws in the country? We don't have our own Congress. There's only one Congress here, and that's it. So you might as well try to work with it and get the best people to do the things that they ought to be doing. I mean, that was the concept. Um, and to get good people working for these members of Congress. So, and also so people learn what the government does and how it works. Because you don't learn it in school. Nobody really teaches you that. You have to be inside to understand it. Who are some of the uh, people, the c congressional people that you uh, felt you had good ties with that helped you through these subsequent things that you did? Well, there was a young senator from South Dakota named Jim Aberesk, uh, who was uh, a really good senator and eager to cooperate and help. Um, he liked IPS. And then there was Phil Burton, who was really, I would say, the best organizer the Democrats have had in Congress in my lifetime. I mean, he really put together uh, he would put together legislation and figure out how to get it passed. He'd count the votes. He says, all right, so we want to get, you know, urban reforms done that will make it easier for us to deal with poverty issues in the city. So, okay, so let the damn farmers have a couple cents, you know, so we'll make a trade. You vote for ours and we'll vote for yours. And he counted up the votes and he was pretty successful on environmental projects and on labor projects on uh, stuff, you know, social, social good. So Phil Burton is the, one of the leading protagonists in the film. And then we have a, a rural southern Walter Jones from North Carolina. We went down and filmed in his district with him. He's another one of the protagonists, and of course Aberesk, who takes us to a hearing at the uh, Sioux Reservation. That's where we made that film, Song for Dead Warriors. Uh, we also had Father Drynan in the film from Massachusetts. He was another good liberal. It was pretty hard to get people on the right to cooperate in that way. We got a couple of Republicans, Chuck Whalen from Ohio, but then he became a Democrat. Um, Maybe your influence. I don't think it was our influence, no. 
Tom Harkin was one of the people that you got to know pretty well, wasn't he? Yes, but Tom was elected as we were finishing the film. Tom was elected in 74. Mm -hmm. And we had basically shot the film, 73 and 74. So by the time that next Congress came in that voted to end the Vietnam War, right. uh, the film was basically done by then. We filmed during the Watergate Congress, and that was right. fascinating right. to see all the Nixon cronies testifying before Senator Irvin, before uh, Congressman Sam Irvin, who was also in the film, of course. And so there's some good shots of the hearing. Kissinger testifying before Senator Fulbright. Uh, some pretty fascinating stuff in there. Can you talk a little bit more about um, what you did um, in Congress or with Congress? Well, and, and, and people from IPS would go to work in Congress. They worked in congressional offices as congressional aides. And this was very useful. Um, I mean, this is access. And I think, you know, oftentimes people on the left don't understand that, that stuff. They think, oh, Congress is an enemy institution. No, this is a way that you get some influence and some access. And this is the way we thought of it. And I think it's a positive way to look at it. And it continues to this day to be uh, a, a way you can get to talk to people. How do you talk to the, the legislature? Well, you start with the staff. You call up and you talk to a staff person. Mm -hmm. And you, that staff person can reach the member of Congress. So I saw nothing wrong in people working as staff people in Congress. I thought it was good. You learn an awful lot. It's a terrific education for anybody. Mm -hmm. Real practicalities. <laughs> um. Also, some of the people went into work, you know, uh, friends of ours went into work in the State Department and other government agencies. Nothing wrong with that. There's a lot of very good civil servants in this country who do their jobs and are excellent citizens. And we have to rely on those people to keep the government honest. The Ernie Fitzgeralds of... Uh, yeah, he's a, a good example in the Defense Department. Whistleblowers. Yes. Well, hopefully they don't have to reach the stage of whistleblowers. Yeah. Now, you've always uh, had a pretty global perspective before you came here. Of course, since... Uh, this is jumping a little ahead, but how do you think that the... Uh, terrible assassinations in 1976 of Latelier and Moffat uh, specifically affected DC's social justice justice community, especially people from other countries who are part of that social, social justice community. Well, I think that the assassinations of Orlando Lotelier and Ronnie Moffat scared the shit out of people. How? Totally. Well, I mean, this was an act of international terrorism. It was the three quarters of a mile from the White House a bomb explodes in a car. Betty Ford, if she wasn't too hungover, could have been taking a stroll that morning and got hit by a piece of shrapnel from the explosion. And you say, you know, people saying, oh, the CIA did it, or that's crap. You know, obviously, why would the CIA want to kill Letelier? They had no reason to try to kill him. There was only one logical enemy that Letelier had, and that was Augusto Pinochet the uh, illegitimate president of Chile. And we knew it, everybody knew it, the FBI knew it. And the FBI diligently pursued the criminals and named most of them in the indictment. Pinochet's name never appeared on the indictment because of a, a lack of courage inside the Justice Department or inside successive administrations. His name should have been on that indictment. They got his chief of secret police and the number two guy. Those guys got indicted along with the actual organizer of the plot itself, mm -hmm. plus the Cubans who helped him carry it out. But the FBI did its job. I have to say that. As I told them at the time, I said, you guys finally solved the case. Yeah, they did. It, it, it didn't take a long time, as I recall. A couple of years. A couple of years, two or three years, yeah. was it? Because it was so obvious who it was. Yes. they just. They knew who it was, they just hadn't identified him by name. So they finally put his picture in the paper, and then, of course, he was immediately identified, Michael Townley. Mm -hmm. And he's in jail now? For no. Life, isn't he? No. No? He, he was sentenced to 10 years. He ratted on all the others oh. and was given a plea deal for 10. Got 10 years, served five. And today he lives uh, in Kansas. Mm -hmm. 
where he is a land developer or a real estate developer after giving up his Radio Shack concession. By the time that you uh, came to Washington, I think COINTELPRO was already a few years old. Yes. And I know that the Institute and, and probably you specifically were one of, their, one of their targets. Can you talk a little about that? Or what yeah, COINTELPRO, which FBI counterintelligence, right? It was indeed against all intelligence to do this. They sent, I don't know, 72 informants into the Institute for Policy Studies. <sighs> Most of them never got beyond the lobby, by the way. Who and were they? I mean, they were young people, you know, some of them who got caught smoking or dealing drugs right. and saying, if you, if you uh, want, you know, to escape prison, here's what you got to do. Or it's, usually the cops had some hold on them. There were a couple of them who were actually right-wing zealots who wanted to do this. One of whom went to work for a guy named Carl Hess, who at that time was a fellow. He was a right-wing, well, he was a libertarian. He had been one of Goldwater's speechwriters. Carl Hess. Carl Hess had. And he was a fellow at IPS. And so his intern, who had infiltrated the institute, spilled the beans and said, I'm working for the FBI, but I don't understand why. You guys aren't doing anything subversive. And so Carl immediately told everybody. A case developed out of this, and the uh, Institute sued the FBI and won. And the judge said to the FBI, stop this immediately. Pay the Institute for its legal fees and cease and desist these kinds of operations. You think they did? No. I think they did for a little while. But they came back in with the Central America movement so in the 80s. They came back in. There's a lot of but why they were doing this, you know, I have no idea other than, you know, if you see, saw that Clint Eastwood movie, J. Edgar, yeah. with Leonardo DiCaprio as playing Hoover, mm -hmm. I think it's a pretty good psychological portrait of who the guy was. He liked to keep records on everybody, mm -hmm. and he distrusted radicals in the extreme. Mm -hmm. He just thought we were all unpatriotic. I mean, there was one in interesting one where they were tapping the phones of people at IPS, and they had dropped actually a wire into Mark Raskin's office, and they were photographing people. They had rented a room in the DuPont Plaza, which was next door to the Institute in the old days. Just, you know, when you think of it all, it's a total waste of the taxpayers' money. It was ridiculous. We got mountains and mountains of files of stuff they had collected. It was garbage. It was, you know or you know, reports that their informants had written. You know, so-and-so white single female looking for you know, white single female to share apartment. This is the kind of stuff they were getting from the bulletin board, right? That's, you know, what did you expect you'd find? You know, yeah. people who come to IPS. Anyway, they weren't getting, they, there was no evidence at all that we were a Soviet controlled, you know, a fifth column in the United States because we weren't. And it was ridiculous. The whole thing was stupid. So COINTELPRO didn't have much luck here. With they, didn't get in, they didn't get much intelligence. And, and as the, their title implies, it was counter to all intelligence to have done this. We did, run what, we did make a little film with an FBI agent named Robert Wall, who was one of those who ran agents into the Institute for Policy Studies. And his wife, a religious Catholic woman, said, why are you doing this? People haven't, these people haven't done anything. Why are you infiltrating their place? Why do you, what, what's wrong with you? And she finally convinced him that he was doing something immoral, and he quit the FBI and told all. So we did this little film with him, and he came back to IPS. And we filmed him with Mark and Dick in the same room. What would you say... Uh, in your years, uh, through the 70s at least, uh, was, the most, uh, was the most important thing you've, that you've done in, uh, in your life? What are the most important things that you're the most proud of have you done, you done in your political life, basically? Well, I think raising my children. <laughs> five kids? Five, five kids, and they're all, they all knock wood. have yeah. turned out to be people I'm proud of, I, who I, whom I admire. And what are they doing? Tell me what they're doing. Well, one of them is a musician. And he writes music and produces music and has made a lot of albums. He gets five Grammy nominations. And he's also a professor at San Francisco City College. So he teaches working people. 
Uh, my older daughter is a director of um, assessment at a university in Oakland. Uh, good job, and she does good work. She's an inventor, basically. My next daughter is a doctor, practices, treating people who need medical help. Is that the one that graduated from medical school in Cuba? Yes, she graduated uh, from ELAM, the Escuela Latino Americano de Medicina, Latin American School of Medicine in Havana. Where is she practicing? She practices in New Mexico. Mexico. Um, my next daughter just got her master's in journalism from UC Berkeley and is going to be a health journalist. And my youngest daughter is getting her master's in English literature and I think wants to be a book editor. They're all terrific kids and I, I admire them all. So I think that's my most uh, illustrious act, if you like, is helping to, in some way or another, raise those kids. Well, yeah, it's passing on what you know and what you've learned, and that's the biggest contribution you can make to the next generation is help grow people that yes. are good. Yeah, other than that, I made a few movies and written a few books. And What's your favorite movie that you made? The one I like best? The, the last one I did is called uh, Will the Real Terrorist Please Stand Up? And it's a 50-year, it's a history of 50 years of U.S.-Cuba relations as told through the mouths of the actual terrorists who are carrying out policy, U.S. policy, most of whom live comfortably in Florida today. Uh, I also, I, I like the film I did in Mexico called The Sixth Sun, the Mayan uprising in Chiapas. Uh, from an artistic and political standpoint, I think we told a good story there with Subcomandante Marcos in the jungles of Chiapas. I don't think anybody has really put that story down otherwise. So uh, I'm, I'm proud of those. And I think we did that one I told you about in Congress, who shot Alexander Hamilton. It's sort of a choreography of the Watergate Congress. And I think it will give people an insight of, as to how Congress actually works. Even that was different from today. Yes. It's much worse today. Well, so today we have then. the best Congress money can buy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, okay. Okay. Let's wrap this one up. We have eight minutes. What? Eight minutes? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Um, back to uh, Washington, D.C. and being here in the 70s. And, uh, visiting there before, uh, visiting here before. Uh, what do you think that, um, how can I ask this? Uh, when people come to Washington, D.C. to be a part of a big demonstration or maybe a homegrown lobby group or, you know, various things, they always have a certain impression of Washington, D.C. How, how do you think that differs from what, what it's like to live here, to actually live here and be here? Well, living here in the 70s, mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. was a black city. It's less so now. Yes. Um, and most of the people who came here, you know, to listen to Martin Luther King make his great speeches, <laughs> which were the, the really significant events of the 1960s, yeah. most of them never went into the black area, black ghetto areas. Yeah. And they saw only a certain part of northwest Washington and maybe Capitol Hill. But that's it. They didn't really see the city. Yeah, they don't have a sense of its local localism. No, and okay. I mean, when you live in Washington, of course, you, you get to see and understand what the city is. And it's uh, uh, a black city and with a lot, a lot of poor people in it. And a rich government and a rich street called K Street. Mm -hmm. But um, the tourists or the people who come in for the demonstrations don't get that. They see the mall and they see the Smithsonian's and the stuff that the tourists see. You're, but it's a tough city. Your younger, your younger kids must have gone to school in the district. My three, uh, yes, my two, two of my daughters graduated. One of them went to Duke Ellington. And the other one we pulled out of, uh, I forget, Alice Deal, I think she was at. Um, and she finished at Georgetown Day. But the uh, oldest one gradu didn't graduate from Duke Ellington's, but did three years there. There's a lot of uh, 
And they all went to Lafayette School up in Northwest. Oh, yeah. That's a good little school. Yeah. Well, um, I noticed, though, that you, all your kids are in California pretty much, except the one that's in Mexico. So New Mexico. Two, of them in, two are in New Mexico. New Mexico, okay. But none of them live here now. They're not DC kids. Really no, no, they all work. left. They all left DC with their parents. Yeah. Well, one of them actually left home and said, "I'm going out on my own." <laughs> she became a doctor. Right. Uh, and the others went with their parents. <laughs> the youngest okay. two. Is there is there anything that, you know, uh, I don't have any more questions for you. But is there anything else that you'd like to? Well, talk living about? in living in DC, you organize mainly against the U.S. government, not so much against the city government. Yeah. I mean, that's the key. It's the home of two governments. And one government so overshadows the other one. And most of the organizing was directed against uh, U.S. laws, not local laws. I mean, the local police enforced the federal laws, but uh, that was their job. I mean, they were the enforcers. But they weren't, I mean, and they were involved. I mean, when the Letelier assassination occurred, the D.C. homicide cops were the first ones in it before the FBI grabbed jurisdiction of it. And there was some lieutenant, I remember his name now, Wilson, who stole the papers from Letelier's briefcase and photocopied them and, made, and sent them all around to the right-wing members of Congress. And... and uh, it was an attempt to divert the investigation, you know, and make the victim into the uh, into the guilty party. Didn't work so well, but I remember that role being played by a lieutenant in the police department here. Was that he took the briefcase from the car? In the exploded car. Oh my gosh. And it, it showed that Latelier was going to a meeting in Cuba because that's where the central committee of his exiled party met. And the reason they met there was that the, uh, one of the chiefs of the party, which was Tati Allende, Allende's daughter, lived there. She married a Cuban. And the other reason that they met there is it was safe because there were assassination attempts being made in many cities by Pinochet's secret police against the exiled politicians like Letelier. But they twisted it around to say, see, they're going to Cuba, and they're going to meet with Tati Allende, and she's a KGB agent, as if. Anyway, and so he was branded a KGB agent, which was ridiculous. You know, blame the victim. That was the attempt. Didn't work. His spirit lives on. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, you, you can see from the mural here at IPS, the, the size of the crowd that went to his memorial. This was the march that went from DuPont Circle down Connecticut Avenue mm -hmm. to St. Matthew's, mm -hmm. where Joan Baez mm -hmm. sang uh, Gracias a la Vida, the Violeta Para song that made me cry. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that. And you see in the crowd is Mrs. Allende and Latelier's kids, two of his boys. Uh -huh. And this is Ronnie Moffat's brother. That's Michael Moffat. And there's Isabel yeah. Atelier. And you'll also see Gene McCarthy and George Miller, still a congressman from California.